Hi, Michael Wolf, PGI Compiler Engineer, here for the third in a series of short videos on your very first experiences doing parallel programming with OpenACC. In our last video, we showed the parallel execution of a Jacobi Iterative Solver on a multi-core, and I challenged you to find the easiest way to take that program and run it on a GPU. We're going to show how to do that here. Now I'm going to make another experiment directory because I'm going to be modifying the programs again. Here I have the C++ program with the parallel directives inserted. I want to build this for execution on a GPU. What GPU am I going to be using? We have a utility, PGXL Info, that gives you all the details about the GPUs you have available on your system. In this particular case, I've got a Tesla P100 the fastest GPU on the planet. Compute capability 6.0 with 16 gigabytes of memory, yada, yada, yada. But that's the one we're going to be using. So I'm going to make the C++ program, and I'm going to generate code for the Tesla Compute Capability 6.0, which is the Pascal. The reason I need to specify Compute Capability 6.0 is because the default on the 17.0 and the 1610 compilers is to generate code using the CUDA 7.5 toolkit, which does not support a Pascal. So we need to tell it we're compiling for a Pascal. And I'm adding the managed option to tell it to use managed memory so the data movement between the host and the device memories will be managed by the system and the drivers which simplifies life for me, the programmer. Again, I'm adding the mInfo equals Excel option, so I get informational messages out of the compiler. Before I look at the result, let me skip back up to the informational messages that came out. Here, instead of saying generating multi-core code, it says generating Tesla code for the two parallel loops. It also gives me more information about how it generated code for those loops. It generated loop gang. That's, if you're a CUDA programmer, loop gang corresponds to thread blocks across the grid. And the inner loop is loop vector. And again, for you CUDA programmers, that's the threads within a thread block. For the single loop below, it generates code for that to use both threads in a thread block and all the blocks in the grid. So let's look at the results. It shows here that the time to solve that system was 0.55 seconds. And I'm going to record that up here. Now you're going to look down here and say, well, the time to execute the program was 1.45 seconds. What happened? Where's that 0.9 seconds come from? Well, let me defer that for just one minute. I'm going to try doing the parallel 2K code. So I'm, the matrix will be four times as big, 2K by 2K. See how much faster that is than the CPU. Well, look at this. 1.43 seconds to do the solver and 2.34 seconds overall. Again, 0.9 seconds difference between the two. There's something going on here with that 0.9 seconds. But let me record this down here. What you will also see is if I make this even bigger, a 4K by 4K matrix, so now I'm doing yet another factor of four more work, it still runs really fast. The GPU is a parallel throughput engine. And the more work you throw at the GPU, the better it goes. So I'm doing four times as much work, and it's executing in less than three times as much time because it gets more efficient the more parallel work you're throwing at that. Now, where did that one second come from, that 0.9 seconds between the solution time and the actual execution time? We're going to identify that by using the profiler, PGProf. So I'm bringing up PGProf, the PGI profiler, and on profile execution of this particular program, I'm going to cut the execution down from a 1,000 by 1,000 to just a 200 by 200 matrix. Because what we want to see is the performance characteristics, not necessarily the performance of that particular program. So it's a smaller version of the program, and it's executing. It won't take very long to execute. Eventually we'll finish. And PGProf will bring up its timeline. This might take about 15 seconds. 
All right, so inside here, here is the execution of my parallel operations. Here are all the execution of my kernels. We'll dive a little bit deeper here. And dive even deeper here. And dive even deeper here. And here's the execution of the compute kernel. That's the actual matrix vector multiply. These two kernels are doing the residual computation. This is the vector operation, and this is the summation, the final summation to get the single result. The two little data movements here, you'll see this is moving eight bytes. This is taking the result, take, putting the initial value on the device and bringing the result back to the host. When we zoom back out to the whole timeline, we'll see that this time takes about, oh, the whole execution of the program looks like it takes about 170 milliseconds, about two tenths of a second. What's going on here at the beginning and the end? Well, this is the cost of your program to connect to the GPU and create a context. And at the end, this is the cost to disconnect from the GPU and to shut down that context. This is particularly expensive on a Linux system because the default on a Linux system, which is what I'm running, is to power the GPU off when you're not using it. And then when you connect a program to it, it's got to power it back up create a context, and start executing. And that takes, well, a significant amount of time. In this case, almost a second, and again, a half a second to shut it down. This is a one-time cost in your program. If I were running anything other than a simple sample benchmark program, you wouldn't even notice that startup and shutdown cost. In this case, though, it dominates the execution of my whole program. I'm going to dive back in to my execution here. And what we're going to see is there's no data movement. Other than for the initial and result value of the reduction operation, where is the data? How is the data being managed? Well, that's the advantage of managed memory, of the Tesla colon managed option with the PGI compilers. Tesla colon manage tells the compiler to generate code so that in C++, new and delete operations, in Fortran, allocate and deallocate, and in C, malloc and calloc and free operations are done using CUDA managed memory. There's some advantages of using CUDA managed memory. And there's some disadvantages as well. The allocates themselves are significantly more expensive. But data movement between host and device memory is now managed by the drivers. As long as locality works, and locality typically works pretty well, as long as locality works, the data will move once and will just stay where it needs to be. In this case, it stays on the GPU. There's also a heck of a lot of dead space here. Look at all this dead space between the launching of these kernels and the dead space between one iteration of the loop and starting the next iteration of the loop. What's going on there? What's going on is the host code. Look how long it takes. This is the, how long it takes to launch a kernel. The kernel itself takes almost no time at all. And then here it has to launch the next kernel. And then the kernel itself takes no time at all. And then here is where it's launching the next kernel. And again, the kernel itself takes no time at all. So there's a lot of overhead. Can we somehow remove some of this overhead? So that's going to be two steps ahead. The next step will be, what if I want to or need to manage data movement manually as opposed to using the managed memory? Managed memory has some disadvantages. As I said, one of them is the cost of the allocates. Another one is, depending on your device, the program has to synchronize after every kernel launch. If you really want to do asynchronous operations, you may want to manage the memory manually. So your next step is take the program that you have and you manually manage data movement between the host and the device. Come back for the next video and we'll show you how to do the manual data movement.